Okay, so let's talk about free energy or Gibbs energy. And so what Gibbs energy is, is this is a calculation, it's a way of analyzing thermodynamic change by combining the enthalpy, which reflects the change in the internal energy of the constituents of the parts of a chemical reaction and the conditions of the temperature at which this reaction is happening in Kelvin and entropy. So in a sense, it's sort of like the energy from the environment, the effect of the surroundings, so to speak. And so this is a type of calculation and analysis that came from an American uh, scientist named uh, Josiah Willard Gibbs. I think he was professor at Yale in the 1800s. And, there, and he was very much looking at very theoretical high-minded stuff, but there was also a very practical bit, and that's the idea of work. Because there are so many th chemical reactions in our lives that are doing work for us, like the engine in a car or like a generator or what have you. There's also biochemical work that your body is doing and a lot of modern medicine is increasingly making use of thermodynamic understanding to make advances in our health and well-being. So, a change in Gibbs free energy is the maximum amount of work that can be done by a closed fixed volume system. When we have a system where there's gases and the volume is changeable, that's known as PV work, and that kind of brings in some other factors as well. It also can have an application of helping a chemical engineer determine the temperature at which a reaction can spontaneously happen. Or if it's not spontaneous, what kind of energy investment is necessary from the surroundings to make the reaction happen, okay? We're gonna be doing a lab that actually deals with this as an issue, okay? Uh, it does not address the speed or the rate of reactions. So some spontaneous reactions are very fast and others can take minutes, hours, days, years, and centuries. The decomposition of a diamond into just graphite like in a pencil. You know, this is the hardest substance in the world. It is a spontaneous reaction, but it happens slowly in the thousands of years. We do not see a diamond turn into pencil graphite in our lifetimes. It's an extremely slow, slow process. So spontaneity does not address speed. Okay. It's just the, the favorability of whether the reaction will happen. So if we have a negative change in Gibbs energy when we do our calculation, that is called favoring products. It's spontaneous. It will happen under those conditions. Once again, the speed, we are not addressing that in this calculation. A positive change in Gibbs free energy will favor reactants. In other words, it does not favor the the reaction going to completion to where we have more product than reactant, okay? This is non-spontaneous. So it's just basically in the balance sheet. Are we gonna have more product when we're over at equilibrium or are we gonna have more reactant when we're done? Equilibrium, we would just say at these, this temperature and pressure, it's done. That's what we mean by have, uh, equilibrium. Once again, like in, um, enthalpy and entropy, if you see the not symbol, that means we're applying understanding standard conditions, 25 degrees Celsius, 298 Kelvin, and one atmosphere of pressure. So all your thermodynamic tables are making this assumption. We will later get into situations where we are not at standard temperature, but for now, that is the assumption we make. Um, we can also, if we have at our disposal thermodynamic tables that have worked out Gibbs for individual substances, like our other two, it's products minus reactants. So it's the same idea. And there are also several other ways to represent Gibbs free energy that we'll be getting into later that uses something called the Nernst equation that allows us to look at electrochemical stuff like a battery. And, and, or battery-like 
transfers of electrons in a redox reaction that we harness as electricity. So if we have a negative enthalpy, we know that that is exothermic. We've gone into that. If we have, you know, go back to the earlier videos if you need a refresher on that. And sort of corresponding in a sense, uh, a negative enthalpy tends to strongly support negative gifts, which is spontaneous. It does not guarantee it, but it does support that spontaneity. Also, if, however, a change in enthalpy is endothermic, it tends to support you know, a possibility that we're going to have a non-spontaneous reaction, and that's a positive gives. So this has actually been generalized along with entropy or the entropy, change in entropy times temperature expression in this little table that's in every single chemistry textbook you'll ever see. So generally, if we have a negative enthalpy and a positive entropy, we're going to pretty much have a spontaneous reaction. It's negative gives. If we have a positive enthalpy and a negative entropy, that is essentially a guarantee that almost any condition that we know of, that will not spontaneously happen. But then we have the gray areas. What if we have a negative enthalpy, if we have something that's exothermic, but the molecules are combining rather than expanding, you know, which, um, and we, you know, sort of combine that with a positive value for T times S. It could go either way. It could be a positive or a negative gift. It will be spontaneous if, it's if the temperature is high. But if the temperature is low in this particular case, it will not be spontaneous. And then we have the reverse case where we have a positive enthalpy and a positive entropy which will on, would only be spontaneous at a very low temperature and not spontaneous at high. And you can, when we do these work examples, you'll see how this all works out. This is useful to memorize. It is not absolutely essential, but it kind of makes life easier, and it also helps you catch mistakes. If you see, if you get an answer in a Gibbs problem that is, you say is spontaneous, it's a positive Gibbs, and we have a negative enthalpy and a positive entropy, you probably flipped a, a symbol wrong. You probably put a positive where there's a negative or a plus where there's a minus. You probably made a mistake. So do th this is very helpful. So in closing on this particular lesson, once again, we are looking at the availability for a chemical change to do productive work. And this is what Gibbs energy basically tells us. Once again, it can be done used for that, but it also, as we can see here, can perform many valuable other types of analysis in all kinds of fields ranging from chemical engineering to biomedical to biochemical stuff. This is a huge field, it's a huge world of itself, and does have very practical applications.